next item is poems from Big Maple Springs by Lewis Randall. And Lewis Rand Randall, by his own description, is a man who writes poetry, in addition to a great many other things, and a man who has a love for nature. Lewis. Thank you. The full quote was that, I guess I'd really have to go. As a poet, but a man who now and then writes a poem, because if people begin to think of you as a poet, they're going to ask you for another one. And I should say, no, I'm working in my garden. Or I'm fixing my car. <laughs> so, sometimes I write poems. Um, now and then, um, and I mean sometimes, I let myself wonder if humankind as a whole can come to its senses, can create a collective good, or at least a collective truce. But as it is, if even one man or one woman comes fully to his, to her senses, a following or a movement, or sometimes a whole age in that name begins. We're gathered today to honor the vision of John Muir. One man come to his senses. One man who could see could hear, could feel with his own eyes and his own ears. And let us remember, as we revere his great name, that he began here as a little farm boy on the frontier, exactly as thousands of others in similar circumstances, in similar surroundings. And let us remember, as we honor him, that our need is not to see as he saw or what he saw, or to hear as he heard, but to come to our own senses. Whatever sense I have come to, I try to record in poems and fiction, and inadvertently, a lot of nonsense I know. And I'd like to read a few poems this evening and dedicate them, whatever sense may be in them, to the memory of John Muir and to the vision, our own vision, that he inspires. And I would like to think, Muir might listen tonight and know what I mean. On seeing the wildlife art of Robert Bateman, no camera ever captured such fineness of detail, nor caught the wolf or eagle, composed so still, so well. You have seen much of bark, yet not enough of trees. Too much of fur and feather, but not the thing that breathes. All nature looks domestic, frozen in your gaze, and no wind stirs or ruffles these exact and tame cliches. Wilderness Reverie, in early June, when it was yet high spring at that latitude, two friends and I packed ten miles from the car to reach the maple and white bird shores of Lake Superior, cold, blue, immense under the sun of a flawless afternoon. But as the sun dropped, thunder rolled off the water, and vengeful clouds boiled overhead, while my friends donned rain gear and walked the stony beach in search of panoramas Arrangements of line and color suitable for the camera's lens, I retreated to my tent in the darkened woods and zip shut the outer door as the first drops fell. In the last light of dusk, the storm relented and the wind died away. Then I heard, deep in leaves, the hermit thrush, this strange lyric sing, Oh man, we are not you, nor anything to do with you. Not for your ears do thrushes sing, but for ourselves alone each spring we repeat an old refrain recalling how the dinosaur took wing, how the lemur grew your brain, and before these separate destinies how rock sank under rain. 
My mind's dark eye remembers all. The first red bloom in single cell, continents vast of ancient palm, walls of cities that rose and fell. If you hear me now, what then? Long and long after you have gone, I shall sing on, I shall sing on. As the light died from the yellow nylon cloth, separating me from the forest, the rain began again, drumming on the sides of the tent with greater force. Thunder shook the air, and bright bursts of lightning caused my thin shelter to glow with a brilliance that hurt my eyes. My friends came hurriedly, muttering and plashing into camp. By the side of the road, three riddles. Your vision magnified five times. From a snag on the elm I find traffic enough on the road below to fuel my rapid heart. In fence row, dooryard, and fallow field, by June I bloom in profuse galaxies, yet hold my skeleton stars against bitter nights in January. Cast in the ditch under thistle and vetch, I glare back the sun for a year or so. Then bit by bit, I brown and go to the place where they first found me. And this one I'd like to dedicate, I guess, especially to Mira, because I think often of the difference between... No, it's not the same word. It isn't at all. And um, this is really about that difference called Across the Street. Part one. Across the street from the House of Beauty, where the gray matrons and crones of the town, poised like girls in the latest hats, sit composed in blonde, brunette, and black reveries arranged behind plate glass, vain time blown back, quick as spring on the electric breeze of memory. Paintless, doors wide, windows smashed behind box elders brushing at the walls, the Clark House, first house built in the town, sits and sags, persistent as a Buddha, beholding with settled patience the noisy commerce of the street under the plastic Pepsi sign that says, Bob's store, Part two. Sunlight on the parlor wall blanches a row of violets and roses beneath a strip of peeling green. Below the spinet stands, impassive, upright in the trash, on his red tobacco can, Prince Albert, rusted, resolute in black, strides upon the upper keys. Stern, as if he heard some hymn of hard uncomplicated faith in the meaning of forbearance, of virtue in a dour face. At his feet he does not see the coil of electrical wire that leads to the blank TV. In her mind, the roof rained tight. Beneath the shakes her father cut by hand still shelters the attic room and bed where she and a sister slept. As the century, turning in the dark overhead, fled at last, like a great night bird, stunned, myopic in the sudden glare. She never wed, last air. She sleeps two blocks down a side street, bearing her name in a wheelchair, dreaming of the long day where girls run barefoot in the unpaved street, where slow wagons scarcely raise the dust. On sunny afternoons, her walls bloom like bright gardens. The 
What's my 15 minutes up here right now? All right. Am I reading too fast? Am I going to? Wheels locked up by rust, your green luster all gone to rust. Still you hug the arrogant curves of insolence and pride they had in mind when you were made, down finally now to pure design, smug, even in decay. <laughs> I, you know, lighten up, they tell me, so. Sometimes I do. I, you know, I, I try. Okay, let's get heavy. This is, this, uh, I, I love this one, I really do. I just find the finished it. I've just been sitting around uh, longhand and fading a long time and finally made it to the typewriter. And so, because it's very recent, I love it best. Um, it is called Meditation at Crete. It's a kind of uh, uh, shortcut sonnet, I guess. It lacks a couple of lines. If knowledge should grow tenfold tomorrow and fact weigh heavier more legion than stone. If from the furnace of the sun they borrow ships of fire to sail upon the dimmest star and make the cell at last to yield and minotaurs trot like dogs in the streets and chimerae clash upon the battlefield, no nearer to your secret will they be. O water world, Oh, rolling sea, but deeper, farther, starker in your mystery. Let's see, what's light? Jeez. Um, they don't feel heavy when you write them. It's just when you send them. You know, and I uh, read uh, I'm uh, somewhat obsessed with time. And uh, I've got some time poems here, if I can make sense of the disorder. Mm -hmm. ah, let's just go light with a Wisconsin narrative. Vilas County Fish Story for Ellen and David. While well, our daddy knows where the big ones go, to cool in the gloom, far below the sunstruck shallows where, torpid as oak they lie at during the long dog days after mid-July, how frowning, insensible, they settle to the bottom, long jaws locked, stomachs withered, cold brains, thoughtless, of crayfish, minnow, or leech. While well, our daddy knows they go deep. And how sometimes in their sleep they dream of golden frogs or silver dragonflies. How now and then one lunges, the needle teeth impaling shadow. The way to get them now, <laughs> he laughs, pupils enlarged, floating under bifocal glass, is dynamite. <laughs> then, lips pulled thinly back, incisors flashing in lower tones, he adds, there is another way, just after. He moves quickly to the back of a battered, rusted Cadillac, opens the great dented trunk, packed to the fenders with long, stiff rods and spinning reels, and black boxes filled with chrome and brass and copper-plated lures of curved steel and painted plugs, brilliant as October. From a little green metal case, he lifts a thing no bigger than a fly. A slender hook with golden ball for head, the lure of last resort, a jig, he said. Serious now, his white paunch hung over a beltless waist in smooth conviction, his point almost, if not already, won. This time of year they hate the sun and only wake at dusk, not to hunt or feed, but just to breathe a thanks for waters dead of light. 
On certain cloudy nights they rise in meditation, floating near the shore. And though to you the lake looks black, the big ones in their trance each pebble see. Beneath and every dimple on the still surface above that blank, unfocused gaze, I, man of a thousand hooks, at least, for each one know three tricks, you can believe me when I say they will take this thing for a likeness of the sun and strike, not in hunger but anger, swallowing imagined light in heedless rage. They think in one lunch to swallow the burning image of the sun. Or so to me it seems after years of observation, a patent truthful explanation. This much I'm sure of, artificials work when bait won't get a touch. Well, you could lip hook a small perch behind the jig, but that's illegal. Like crawdads, if they won't hit a jig, try dynamite at dawn. One thing I can tell you, these lakes are full of fish. Just give it a try. You'll pull one out tonight, not up here at the bait shop and bar. Keep your line in the water. They're on the bottom now, waiting for cooler weather. Damn the seat. Good luck. Don't go away disappointed. Good luck. Good luck. <laughs> okay, rain is 15 minutes. That's it. I'll just sheaf back together and make way for Eric. <laughs>